Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com and by RockAuto.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Thank you, Alec Webb. Welcome, everyone, to MotorWeek Podcast 155, and a special welcome to everyone watching us on Facebook Live. And by the way... um, there's Joe over there. Joe Ligo, our editor and uh, producer of the Facebook Live section. He's basically uh, making sure the pictures get out to you. And if you've got questions, send them to us. Joe will make sure that he gets them to us during uh, the live cast. So let's get rolling. Go, looking around our table here in Studio C is our road test producer, Ben Davis. Hey, now. Our assistant producer, Greg Carlos. Hey, hey. Our online content coordinator and producer of the podcast, Patrick Lewis. Lucas. Hello. And as a special guest for everybody today, wow. has graced us with our, her <laughs> presence, our FYI reporter, Lauren Morrison, who's up from Florida. Yes. Welcome, I'm, Lauren. Hello, hello. All right. And she okay. brought the sunshine. Know, and she brought sunshine, sunshine, but she's not tanned. You know, it's like, know. come on. All right, we've got our lightning round, a viewer question, a rant and rave. Who knows what we're going to get asked by people that are watching. And here we go. Our first segment, though is a little bit different. Lauren has recently done a segment on a very special museum uh, in Melbourne, Florida, that really says a lot about the history of the American automobile. Why don't you take it from there? Tell us about it. So a gentleman, uh, Mark Pylock, he, uh, over the years, has been slowly accumulating all of these American muscle cars. There's a few foreign uh, cars thrown in there, but uh, over the past 30, 40 years, has slowly amassed about uh, over 260 American muscle cars and has now opened up his very own museum in Melbourne, Florida. And he gave me the chance to come in, check it all out, um, it's actually pretty close to where I lived down in Florida. And while it was being built, I was like, what is this thing? He actually has it powered by solar panels. So I was seeing these solar panels right. being built. And I was like, what is going on here? Found out that it was going to be a muscle car museum. I was like, I got to get inside. Um, I did this a couple of weeks ago. And it was the coolest experience ever. He has, like I said, over 260 cars uh, valued at about $33 million. Everything he's got in there. It's his personal collection. But I know. it's open to the public. So it... <sighs> Not technically. You can't just okay. walk up and go in. Um, what he's doing, I think it's really great what he's doing. So he's opening it up to nonprofits. If you want to have your event there, you essentially pay the nonprofit and you can come in and all of that money goes to the nonprofit. He also opens it up to schools, whether it be elementary all the way up to college. If you're taking some kind of engineering course and want to see the mechanics of a car, he's opening it up to a car club. So not in the sense that you can walk up and say, hey, here, I want to buy a ticket to the club, but um, – it does, it does have some accessibility to the public. All right. Before I ask you what he's got there, <laughs> what, was, what knocked you out when you walked in? Because, after all, these cars are antiques yes. to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, I would have not to, to say- me, I'm afraid, <laughs> but to you. Yes. Um, I would have to say he has, right when you walk in, like on a turn – turntable turnsole, um, a 1966 Shelby 427 Cobra, oh, wow. and it's surrounded by eight Ford GTs, one in every color oh, that Ford my. has made. So that's like the, yeah, so right when you walk wow. in, that's kind of like it, that drops your jaw. Um, I would have to say that was my favorite part, um, but he has every, from 1955 all the way to 2016, a uh, uh, Indy 500 pace car mm-hmm. all every every year. He has the most extensive collection of Yankos. Um, I mean... Did he tell you he has a favorite car? Uh, he said his, that's why he put it on the, the turn, so the, was the, the, Shelby. the Shelby. Yeah, he's like, that. that is his pride and joy, and that's what he really started his, like, love for cars, and he's, you know, just kind of grown the collection around that. Jeez. Yeah. I'd be tempted to sell those GT, four GTs. They're going for Four hundred thousand. I say, he probably doesn't it, care. It, it, what's no. the most yeah. expensive car, single car that he has? Uh, probably that Shelby. I, he told it? me. I, I think it is the Shelby. Yeah. Um, and I mean, he has that front and center. And he said even p- somebody from Ford came out because he was, you know, right. putting it out there that he had a Ford GT in every color that they've made. And they, uh, somebody from Ford was like, "No way, somebody has that in every color." Mm-hmm. Somebody actually came out and like was like, "Okay, well, maybe you did. <laughs> maybe you wow. did for real." That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So pretty, really cool story. Really great video that we got. So you can. Uh, Sounds inside. like an awesome segment. Uh, can't wait to see it. Uh, and basically, if you're a muscle car fan, yeah. and a lot of our viewers are, make sure you uh, 
either hit it on your local public TV station on Velocity or check it after the fact on YouTube. But don't miss it. What, okay. co- uh, what, colors, Go ahead. The, what colors is the cobra that he's got? Uh, I think it was. The... I'm trying to remember. I think it's black. I Sweet. Think it's, yeah, Sweet. it's beautiful. Mm. Let's move on now to uh, a car that we just finished uh, spending them four really nice days Ooh. at a racetrack with the 2017 Porsche 718 Cayman. Uh, we had it down at our winter testing facility in Georgia at Roebling Road Raceway. Okay, guys, uh, you all had time in the car. What'd you think? <laughs> all smiles around the table. Absolutely. I have to Typically, Porsche awesome as you would come to expect from Porsche, especially if you have a chance to drive them like we do. Um, 350 horsepower, you can kind of feel it in the track here and there that it doesn't have the brute power of a 911, but it's the most fun I've had with 350 horsepower, that's for and, sure. And it's, did you miss the fact that it's all four cylinders? I mean, the whole purpose behind the 718 name is because of the heritage that that was the name applied to a four cylinder race car. So now you've all your Caymans are four cylinder turbos. It didn't, doesn't sound as good as the old six, but did you miss it? If you, if you hadn't known it and you were, cause you've <laughs> driven the six cylinder Cayman on that track. Sure. I mean, I might even be embarrassed to say I didn't know that until you just told me. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good thing. I honestly, I didn't, when you're driving the car and everything's happening, I didn't even notice a difference, whether it be acceleration out of a corner, there was no turbo lag that I noticed and I didn't hear the actual turbos. Now, granted, I went on the event. The only thing I think you notice it more outside the car than you exactly do right. When yeah. I'm not driving it, I heard it. And then when I was just driving on the street, that's when I heard it. But as far as thrashing around a track, I didn't notice anything. And it's like Ben said, it's, this, it's the quintessential Porsche where it's just the easiest thing to drive fast. Mm-hmm. You get out of it smiling because it's like, how can I possibly, with my skill level, get that kind of performance out of a car? You know, after four days, that car still had tires left on it, which a lot, most of the rest of the cars we had there did not, which says a lot about how that car was set up. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is set up to run long and hard yeah. all it, the time. It doesn't push through corners. It doesn't oversteer. It rotates perfectly to the point where you feel like there's oversteer happening, but it's not. It's just the, the torque vectoring and everything going on behind you, which the purists may be upset about. but Because it's not tail happy? Exactly. It's yeah. awesome. But I don't even think the thing rolls at all. Uh, and it, It's very flat looking. I like the fact that they've updated the body. I think it looks a little bit more um, uh, interesting. I don't know, maybe a little more muscular than it did before. It's not a big change, and I think if you're not a Porsche fan, you might not notice it too much. But they seem to be a company that is very wedded to little bits of progress all the time. And the summation is a car that keeps getting better when you don't think it can. But here's the question that I get from a lot of uh, uh, Porsche files. They want to know, is this the car that you would tell someone who wants the Porsche experience to get into rather than, say, a 911, assuming, you know, that the money's not really a factor here? That uh, the GT4, was that last year? That was last year. That was amazing. And this is... is, This one is also very amazing, but, uh, yeah, that GT4 really stands out. This was faster than the GT4 by about a half second. Uh, on the straight line. Well, so then I guess for the money, if it's money's a lot not cheaper. An object, though, I'd definitely say get a 911. Why? <laughs> I'm curious. Just to have a 911? Just because, I mean, a 911, I, so 911 legendary? definitely is, yeah. I mean, 911 is, is a stronger car, engine wise, yeah. and around the track. I mean, if money's no object, why not get the 911? But, but you know, let's stay on that just a second because the 911 has gotten bigger, mm-hmm. it's gotten heavier. Turbo. Yeah, you know, and it's, it's turbo too. You don't feel <clears> that. The Cayman is lighter and maybe more, a little more fun to, to, to throw around a track. I mean, on paper, all those things might be true, but with, uh, you know, with the stability management and, mm. and it, even in more advanced systems that they have that you can get, uh, I don't think you'd feel the extra weight or, mm, or size true. of a 911 on the track. Uh, I, I don't know if this is the question you're asking, but I feel like if you were to go in and get a Cayman, you're not getting cheated out of a Porsche, you know, 
you shouldn't feel bad you about like feel not like being you're able a to second class citizen or let's, something like let's that. Let's be honest, right? Yeah, Money is the, an option yeah, for Well, it's, it's not a cheap car. Let's face it. And as, yeah. yeah, the one we had was like ninety grand. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. This is not the entry level sports car that, that but it was. You certainly when it first could came get out. into one and it's every bit of Porsche and you shouldn't feel bad sure. about getting into one because sure, sure. you're Getting a Porsche. I mean, if if you're in the PCA club, if you're a Porsche file, you're going to have one of each anyway. <laughs> Most <laughs> likely. Uh, that must be don't nice. feel bad about Unless getting a PDK Unless you work in broadcasting. Either. Huh? I said don't feel bad. Get, uh, or don't let people kind of guilt you into getting a manual transmission uh, either. No, that, that PDK uh, is PDK incredible. PDK is awesome. It Absolutely. stays awesome and it keeps getting better. Mm-hmm. And and it is the, you know, it's now the undisputed straight line king. It, it just does get any faster. everything so well. Okay, let's uh, completely change our focus. And actually, this is one of the the most challenging things about our job. We test, you know, 140, 50 cars a year. And on any day, uh, Greg and Ben and Patrick and myself might be driving a 718 uh, Porsche one moment and then, uh, you know, some econo box 15 minutes later, and we've got to balance the opinions. So the second car I want to talk about is the 2017 Volvo S90 sedan. Okay, similar chassis to the XC90 that won all the awards last year. The first car to have a semi-autonomous driving system as standard equipment, same Chinese uh, sourced engines. It's the Volvo flagship. Is it a flagship four-door European sedan? I guess that's the first thing that that people might be curious about. Uh, And give me your overall impressions of the car. Patrick, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I thought the really nice fit and finish is um, impressive, just like it was in the XC90. Um, uh, And not much has actually changed from the XC90, which is refreshing because it still looks amazing. It looks very modern and sleek and sort of minimalist a little bit and not um, over the top right it's yeah. not over the top at all it's actually very uh sort of soothing and relaxing to get in there um but i did notice driving it it didn't feel as solid as maybe you know a flagship from like an s class uh, right? well yeah i mean yeah. that's hard granted that's really hard to match how about seven it? More series like, or an I mean, S-class, would but, you how would you compare it to um uh, an e-class let's put it that way it's closer um, in size to an e-class i still think that Benz does a little better in mm. terms of making you feel like you're in a solid luxury car. The the S90s, it felt a little, I don't know if it was hollow or what, but just, you know, hitting certain bumps and certain types of uh, uh, terrain, it just, I don't know, it didn't feel as solid. But other than that, amazing car, and I would, I mean, it's absolutely a, a home run for them again. Guys? I, yeah, I'd have to agree with Patrick. Um, I think I noted the same way that the suspension feels taut, maybe for the sake of being taught because it seemed like they maybe had said well we want a sporty ride and maybe just went over um overboard a little bit um so that was less than desirable uh, another thing and i don't mean to sound like i'm harping on it but the, the and volvo does this throughout the lineup is just the supercharged turbocharged engines is always in the back of my mind for some reason it's complicated <laughs> exactly right i mean it's it works fine and we always get a new car but I, i'm curious how it does after a few years of standard use but it's super comfortable i mean it's it's upscale but also conservative um in a way in a, but a, in and a good way in a good way right yeah. and, I, I really thought it was i don't think it makes any pretense of being a sporty car i mean it drives nice but gosh to me it's it's like if you had to figure out what a pure luxury car in a modern day would be that's this is it yeah, it's uh, it's got like a really open, airy kind of feel to it, where it's just mm. ton of visibility. All your safety features are there. Fit and finish and use of materials is borderline artwork. Yeah, <laughs> it's um, and it's a, so in those it's a aspects, car. definitely a flagship mm-hmm. car. Lauren, yes. I want to actually change gears again. Um, Lauren is not here all the time these days to be able to drive a lot of the cars mm-hmm. that we get in for testing, but you're still doing quite a bit of evaluation mm-hmm. on your own in Florida. Yes. Talk about a couple of the cars you've been in recently down there and give us some opinions and what impressed you. Um, So I just recently started getting some cars. So right now I've got a 2017 Kia Sorento. A couple weeks ago I had a 2017 Mazda CX-3. Both cars that we've liked a lot. Yeah, and I would say the same thing. I mean, it's... Like you said, it's it's fun to get into different cars every week and then kind of, you know, you're in a, a... you know, an SUV one day, sports car the next. I mean, you're 
constantly changing cars. This is cars. why people yeah. would kill to yeah. have these jobs. I know, I know, no. Everybody, you know, in my social circle is like, oh, what? You're driving a new car this week? But no, um, so I, I mean, I love right now, like I said, I'm driving the Kia Sorento. I love it's my favorite thing to do is to review like SUVs. I mean, I am all about bigger, go bigger. <laughs> I mean, like some people are like, oh, I would never. I want like I want to be the biggest car on the road. So when you got in the Sorento, mm-hmm. what was the first thing that popped out at you that that you said, gee, I like this. Uh, well, it's they always give us like the fully loaded. Of so course. I mean, it is the I, ones we can yeah, never afford. Yeah, on exactly. Our own. You know, uh, starts at this much, but really tack on another thirty thousand dollars. No, um, it's really the interior to me. Um, I think it's really nice, really nice finish. Um, I am in the version, the SXL version. So they have the huge panoramic sunroof, which mm. I never thought I'd be a fan of. But then when you're in the sunshine state and there's a whole lot of sunshine going on, just to flip that back, um, it's it's a really cool feature. Um, it's a really nice ride. I never thought I would I'd say that, but um, it is a really smooth ride, really nice ride. And um, I've taken it on, you know, a couple hour drive and it's beautiful, beautiful. We had, we had. Everybody here, when we had one for a long period of time, Mm -hmm. loved it. So, Okay, yes, we do have tough jobs. Joe, you have a question for us. Yes, regarding the Volvo, we had a question about uh, the reliability of today's turbo and superchargers versus, you know, obviously back then they gave us all kind of pause. But what about today on an engine like that? What should we well, expect? Well, I think everybody, is, as Greg indicated, is a little nervous because this is the first uh, powertrains that uh, are the first powertrains in the XC90 and the S90 that have been sourced from China per se, even though lots of components have been. So everybody's sitting around waiting. But on a, on a general note, I will tell you. Back in the earliest days of Motor Week, uh, in the early 80s, we tested uh, a Volvo turbocharged wagon. Uh, That was the old boxy one, and it was their top sporty model. And in those days, those turbochargers would last 50,000, 60,000 miles or or so before they'd start having bearings problems. And those bearings were – those engines were basically oil-cooled. And that was pretty much true of turbochargers in those days. Superchargers, they had that pretty ironed out. They weren't that much of a problem. Fast forward to today, and virtually every turbocharged engine I know of, the turbo is now water-cooled. And the water cooling is much more efficient. It keeps flowing even when the engine is off. And we're not hearing the type of maintenance problems on modern turbos that we used to hear about them, say, 30 years plus ago. Uh, Superchargers still uh, still remain probably a little bit superior in maintenance, uh, but basically uh, it's, I don't think it's a worry anymore. It's a good thing because virtually everything we drive today has got some kind of a turbocharged or supercharged engine on it. Anybody have, you do a lot of your own maintenance. Do you have any experience in that area? Mm, Just uh, my dad had a supercharger on top of a 327 Chevy back in the day, but it was kind that of was like another a roots classic. Type. Yeah, it's not really. <laughs> so I hope that helps. I hope that gives yeah. a decent answer. Let's move on to our lightning round. Okay, uh, our gang here at the table has two minutes to debate a trending automotive topic. And when we hear Patrick hit the bell over there, uh, we eventually have to be quiet. With the North American International Auto Show, otherwise known as the Detroit Auto Show to most of you, is still fresh in our minds. There looks to be a trend. Oh, gosh. Again, back to touchscreens. All right. Uh, Even Audi looks like they're making these transition uh, based on their new Q8 concept, which did away with the central controller, the um, system that we've liked so much in their products. Um, The... General feeling is is that with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto being added to so many vehicles, uh, manufacturers are telling us that they want to replicate how they operate, not just on the screen, but using the touchscreen interface the same as you would on a phone. I I know what most of us think about this, but let's talk about this. (laughs) So step forward, step back, or step sideways? Who wants to start? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say it's a step back. Uh, just because I I understand that they think, or maybe they've even tested people who want the uh, smartphone technology in their car. Uh, but the big difference there is, is when you're using your cell phone, is it's literally, it's right here. You're not reaching, and, I, and I'm talking 
specifically from a usability standpoint. It's not up here. It's so not four be, feet right. away up yeah. on the deck. Right. So if, I mean, it's, it's fine and good that you want to be able to use the same gestures, and I get that. And I think Mercedes is really the only one that does all the gestures right here in the center controller. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as going back to touchscreens, I mean, I've said it a million times. I just don't like that idea. But just when we were giving Honda mm. kudos for putting a knob back on the dash of the <laughs> CRV yeah. for the radio, and what happened? Anybody else? I I just don't get how a touchscreen is like considered less distracting or like a better alternative to the old knobs. I get that they want to be, you know, on the cutting edge of technology or you know like breaking the mold of what a car <clears throat> interior can be, but. They're trying to tout it as, like, less distracting and safer, which is absolutely not the case at all because, you know, half the time you miss what you're trying to point at while you're driving or there's so many things on the screen that you you yeah. have to take your eyes off the road to yeah. just see what you're doing. Yeah, just to, like, change the radio, I mean, it's hard to just find the station that you want. And like you said, Patrick, like, you're looking at it, you're taking your eyes off the road. I mm-hmm. agree. It's I think it's more of a distraction than it is uh, not. I would hope these research groups um, – conduct with a moving vehicle i mean it's one thing to be in a room with this stuff it's something else to be basically driving at uh, 70 miles an hour yeah yeah anything can be awesome if you're just sitting in a parking lot doing it are are they making any strides forward and trying to better the speech recognition i mean or they just i guess everybody wants to go through the phone which theoretically siri and, and now google with how good they're they're getting which still isn't quite there but i mean that's the direction that we should be moving in. I think they are, but think about it. Uh, most of the voice recognition systems that we deal with, you've got to hit the button once and kind of tell it the area you want to do, and then like navigation or radio. Then you got to hit the button again, and then you got to hit the button again. You're doing four and five gestures to get just to the menus often where you can then use voice recognition. I think this whole, to me, voice recognition makes sense, but only if it works pretty seamlessly. I haven't seen it yet. I don't know. We we get an awful lot of vehicles in here. Some are better than others. That's where you need the whole Hey Siri thing, where you don't have to push a button. The fact that you say, Hey Siri, it starts listening, and then you give your command. Once that gets tied into the rest of the car, where you can say, Hey Siri, turn on my heated seats. And hey, do Siri, it just do about this. that simply. Because a bad perpetrator right now is we have the, uh, the Chrysler Pacifica in. As much as I love the car or the van, to go put on the heated seats, you have to go through the touchscreen yeah. menu, which yeah, is terrible, a terrible <laughs> idea. Yeah. yeah, that's one thing of, uh, of the, uh, the uh, Chrysler interface I think that we all agree on, that it's okay. It, matter of fact, it's a big screen. It works very well. But to have the only way you can turn the heated seats on to be up on the screen is not a real cool thing. Okay, mm. so I think that's a thumbs down pretty much from all around the table. We've got a viewer question from Larry. He says, uh, do you know if there's a safety regulation or any safety regulations concerning the size or square inches of stoplights or turn signals from a distance? I can see the turn signals being on due to it being so close to the small brake light. I'm not sure I get that, but anyway. He says he can't see it. Thank you. I mean, I do have glasses on, but that's not helping. Uh, I do like the turn signals being yellow instead of red on some cars, but I wish they would be bigger. What are your thoughts? Okay. There are lots, Larry. There are tons of regulations and standards governing all sorts of lights on your car, including the high-mounted stoplight and the stoplights in back. I, too, don't understand why some vehicles, they're nice and bright, and other vehicles from a distance of uh, 300 feet, you can barely see them unless it's completely dark. I was coming back up 95 from Roebling, and I was behind. We were in a rainstorm, and there were cars in front of me using their brake lights. I couldn't tell that they were on. Now, sometimes it's people put in the wrong bulbs when they change the bulbs. That's possible. The regulations set forth by the government, and there's more standards set forth by the Society of Automotive Engineers, stipulate visibility for all the lights on the cars. Uh, there, is, there are uh, regulations or at least understandings about placement. They need to mark the corners of the vehicle. Uh, I believe they have to also be visible from the side. Well, that's why most of them wrap around. But apparently there's still enough latitude uh, that the designers can basically 
have some play with styling and we end up with some of the lights that work really well and some of them that don't. And correct me if I'm wrong, the, the yellow uh, turn signals he's talking about, that's, that's a European holdover, isn't it? Because that, uh, that's the way they, I think they have to, had or had to, to be in Europe. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, my Tahoe has yellow ones yeah. on the rear. And it's – I know as a – when I'm driving, I love seeing yellow turn yeah, signals because everything just kind of blends in otherwise. Yeah, but it's not, it's not <clears throat> required here. And I know for a while uh, a lot of the imports were sticking with it. But now they seem to be few and far between. I, I've, I have noticed that side marker lights, especially on the front, um, if a vehicle's coming at me, they got their left turn signal on and I'm uh, like a T intersection – you can you can barely see that stuff sometimes with yeah. the, the haze that people let go on their lenses and the, the well, just this overall smallness of the yellow yeah. side marker lights these days up front. I think we should have mandatory uh, fender uh, turn signals close to the door, like uh, mm-hmm. like a lot of cool European cars. Like have. The, a lot of the a lot older of Japanese European cars, cars and Japanese yeah. too. Yeah. So the answer is, Larry. There seems to be there's a lot of regulation. There's a lot of standards. But apparently there's still enough flexibility that some cars have really good lights all the way around and some cars don't. And I'm not sure that answers your question, but that's the best I could come up with. You can write to your congressman and yeah. see if we can get some more. Oh, please, not more regulation. <laughs> all right, rant and rave, anyone? Anybody got something on their mind? Uh, Lauren? You look like you're about I bursting know. with, I'm trying with to something. Think. No, okay, I'm trying to think you're driving something. in Florida. You okay. can't tell me that's the same as driving anywhere else. <laughs> is is there anything unique about Florida drivers that you want to say that won't get you? Uh, I was going to say um, what hate mail. Yeah, uh, hate mail. Um, <laughs> we actually had a question for Lauren in specific. Ooh. So if she's willing. To all say. right, all, all right. right. Go ahead. Uh, uh, one of our viewers wants to know: Have you? done anything or researched anything or done a story on the uh, VW buyback program for their, their diesel cars? Well, we've done a couple of motor news. Yeah, yeah, we've, we've done a couple of motor news. I've never, I haven't done anything in depth about it. Um, I mean, it's definitely... I don't know what they want to know, but I mean, basically, the first thing they should do is just sit down at their computer and type it in because they'll get about 8 million stories. Uh, yeah, uh, the dealer can tell them, but in general, they're they're getting well over five thousand um, dollars. The cars, if they turn the car in, uh, plus that's on top of whatever the car is actually worth. Uh, if they don't want to do that, some of them so far can be fixed. They haven't come out with fixes for some of the older models yet. But there's a lot of information out there. The um, just this uh, past week or so, uh, some of the newest judgments came down. The best thing they can do probably is go look at. Um, to talk to the dealer, uh, go talk, uh, go look on the internet to some of the VW forums, and even do some searches on some of the government uh, websites that uh, deal uh, like the EPA. They'll give you um, uh, some information. But basically, if you've got one, uh, you're in for a sizable hunk of money. Yeah, yeah. Almost enough probably to buy a brand new car. Wish I had one. Any other rant and rave? Uh, <clears throat> I, I could go. Yeah. I could go. Small rant and rave. Sure. Um, it's on the uh, what well, we were talking about taillights and turn signals and whatnot. And we were driving all up 95 back from uh, Roebling. Um, Semi trucks, 18 wheelers. They're uh, uh, stoplights and like blinkers on the back are tiny. They're those little they are circles. Tiny. And like yeah. it was raining. You want to talk about not being able to see that thing? And when you got a truck that big. And it's raining, you can't see anything, and all of a sudden there's, you know, an 18-wheeler in front of you who's slammed on his brakes and you can't tell. That's scary. Yeah, I think that's doubly scary because if you hit the back of one of those, you're going to go underneath. Yeah. That little bumper bar they have in the back is not going to keep you from that. And and the next thing you know, the bed of that trailer is about eye level through your well, windshield. Well, you know, it's funny because so. there are, like, some incredibly modern trailers, mm-hmm. and then the, you see some really old ones, too. And so I don't know. Not – a few years ago, I was driving, um, I think it was on Interstate 64 out of Richmond, and I saw started coming along all these cars on the side of the road with flat tires. And what had happened is one of those bumper bars on the back had rusted through and fallen oh, off. Oh, my gosh. And the, um, there's bolts on the back of it, and they were all sticking up, and people were running over <laughs> that and getting three and, you know, two oh, and three crazy. and four uh, flat tires at one time. So uh, that – that's. I think that's true. A lot of older tractor trailers have very, very terrible lighting. And with all of the enforcement for safety you see for tractor trailers, that's kind of surprising. 
Okay, I think that about does us for this uh, motoring podcast number 155. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you around the table. Lauren, it was great having you with us. Yes, thank you, thank you. Ben, thanks for being with us and contributing. Greg and Patrick, it's always fun to, to do these with uh, uh, these guys and gals because they uh, they hold nothing back. We want to thank Joe Ligo for making sure that our Facebook Live fans uh, get to see and hear us today. <laughs> Those of you that are watching us as a regular podcast, you have Jim Bigwood to thank for making that, that sound come through so well every week. Our podcast creator is Bob Mixter. Our podcast producer, as I mentioned, is Patrick Lucas. And uh, to all of you out there, thanks for watching and listening to Everything Motor Week. Thanks for watching us on public television stations and Velocity and also on YouTube. Till the next time we interface, I'm John Davis. For all of us at Motor Week, thanks for being a part of the show. You have been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by TireRack.com and by RockAuto.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at motorweek.org. And watch MotorWeek, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.